Hello everybody, we're here for the next couple of chapters of Crindle Cracks. Uh, in the last chapter, even though Ruskin had been avoiding Corky, he, uh, Corky came to Ruskin's house, just to check he was all right, and he had a helmet with a torch on, and Ruskin thought that Corky was gonna go into the darkness again in the sewers, but Corky said, no, this helmet's for you. So let's find out why this helmet is for Ruskin and what he's going to do with it. Chapter 35. But, but I don't deserve it, Ruskin said. I ran away from you in the school playground and Elvis has stolen the medal you gave me. All I've got left is a pin. Corky smiled and shook his head. That doesn't matter, my dear boy, he said. A pin is a useful thing to have. But, but there are other things as, as, as well, st stammered Ruskin. Listen, Corky said, nothing matters, only that we remain friends. You understand me? That's the only important thing. So you still want me for a friend, Ruskin asked. I always want you for a friend, Corky said. They hugged each other. Corky, said Ruskin, I'm still curious about what you did to get the medal. Will you tell the story? Oh, I'm so tired, Corky said. Can't it wait a while, my dear boy? Please, pleaded Ruskin. Corky sighed and said, well, I'll tell you as much as I can before tiredness overtakes me. Corky took a deep breath. When I was a child about your age, I had no friends. Don't ask me why, it's just the way it was. I think other children thought me strange because all I wanted to talk about was the theatre and actors and actresses. So I played alone for most of the time and my favourite place to play was the dump. What's the dump? asked Ruskin. Well, it's not there anymore, said Corky, but it used to be an area of waste ground. I used to play there every day. It was great fun. And then, and then one day I found something. Corky yawned. What was it? asked Ruskin, eyes wide. At first I couldn't make it out, said Corky. It was sticking out of the ground. It was pointed and shining like the head of a gigantic silver fish. Oh, Corky yawned again. Come on, urged Ruskin. No, my dear boy, Corky said, rubbing his eyes. Please forgive me, but I'm far too tired. I'll finish the story tomorrow. But began Ruskin. Tomorrow, said Corky. Ruskin smiled and nodded. Now, said Corky, time for bed. Corky stood up and walked down Lizard Street. His walking stick made harsh tap-tapping sounds on the cracked pavement. When he got to his front door, Corky turned and waved to Ruskin. Ka-clunk, went the drain. Ruskin waved back. Eek, went the pub sign. Corky went into his house. Corky closed the door. Ruskin put the tin helmet on and switched on the torch. The beam of light shone all the way down Lizard Street. Ruskin walked up to the dragon and golden penny. He shone the beam of light at the sign with the tiny green crocodile on it. There it is, thought Ruskin, the baby that became Crindle Cracks. He stood at the sign for a long time, listening to it go eek in the nighttime breeze. On his way home, he suddenly felt an overwhelming desire to knock on Corky's door, wake him up and tell him he loved him. But he resisted. After all, it would be unfair to disturb Corky's dreams to tell him something he could be told in the morning. It could wait until tomorrow, just like Corky finishing his story. Both things could wait until tomorrow. Ruskin walked home. The noises of Lizard Street echoed around him. Ka clunk Eek! The boing tissue. Chapter 36. The next day when Ruskin got up, he looked out of his bedroom window to say, Good morning, Lizard Street, and saw an ambulance parked outside Corky's house. Two men were putting a stretcher in the back of the ambulance. The stretcher had a white sheet over it. For a moment, Ruskin didn't move. He just watched the ambulance and the two men with the stretcher and the people of Lizard Street standing nearby. Mr Lace was there wearing his scarf and sucking pencils. Mrs Walnut was there smelling of potatoes. Dr Flowers was there clutching a handkerchief and sneezing noisily. Mr Flick was there in his green waistcoat with big brass buttons. Mr and Mrs Cave were there smoking cigars. Elvis was there bouncing his ball. 
Sparky was there saying, yes, sir, to Elvis. Everyone was there except Ruskin saw something on the pavement next to the ambulance. At first, he thought it was a long twig, but it wasn't a twig. It was a stick, a walking stick, a walking stick like the one that belonged to Corky. Corky, said Ruskin softly, then louder, Corky. He ran downstairs. His mum and dad were peering around the front door. Something's happened to Corky, Ruskin cried. Don't interfere. He needs me, Ruskin said, pushing past his dad. It's not my fault, said Winston. Ruskin ran down the street and up to the stretcher. He clutched at the white sheets. Don't, Ruskin, said Mrs. Walnut. There's nothing you can do. It happened early this morning, said Dr. Flowers. We found him on the pavement, said Mr. Cave. He was on his way to school, said Mr. Lace. Must have been a heart attack, said Mrs. Cave. Yes, they all murmured, a heart attack. The doors of the ambulance closed and it drove away. The street was very quiet. Ruskin picked up Corky's walking stick and stared at everyone. He was trembling and his eyes were full of tears. Ruskin knew it wasn't a heart attack. He knew that after all these years, Crindlecracks had finally got Corky. It's all your fault, Ruskin cried, every one of you. And he pointed at Dr Flowers saying, it's your fault because 11 years ago you said the pubs I needed painting. Then he pointed at Mr Lace saying, and it's all your fault because you suggested Mr Cave copy a crocodile. Then he pointed at Mr Flick saying, and it's your fault because you agreed with Mr Lace. Then he pointed at Mr Cave saying, and it's your fault because my dad wanted to be your friend. And he pointed at Mrs Cave saying, and it's your fault because you went into hospital to have Elvis. And he pointed at Mrs Walnut saying, and it's your fault because you fell asleep and let the crocodile escape. Ruskin ran back home. He pushed past his mum and dad and rushed up the stairs. At the top step, he turned round and pointed at his mum saying, and it's your fault because you threw toast down the drain. Then he pointed at his dad saying, and it's your fault because you stole the crocodile in the first place. Ruskin ran into his room. He flung open his window. I hate you, Lizard Street, he screamed, his voice louder than anyone had ever heard it before. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. There's Ruskin with Corky's walking stick looking very, very sad. I feel very sad as well. <clears throat> Chapter 37. Ruskin lay in bed, spread out across the blankets in front of him where Corky's walking stick the tin helmet with the torch and the pin from the medal lay. Tears dripped constantly from Ruskin's eyes and soaked the pillows and the mattress. Wendy came up to see Ruskin. Kiss? No. Tea? No. Toast? No. Baked beans on toast? No. Poached egg on toast? No. Scrambled egg on toast? No. Fried egg on toast? No. Then what do you want? Wendy asked. I want Corky back, Ruskin replied. Wendy sat beside Ruskin and stroked his forehead. He's not coming back, darling, she said. You've got to understand that. He's dead. We've all got to die sometimes. This is just the first time you've experienced it. Corky's body got tired, that's all. No, Ruskin said. Crindlecracks got him. What's Crindlecracks? The giant crocodile from the sewers, the one that dad stole from the zoo, the one that cracks our pavements and scorches our bricks and digs up our roads, the one that's been searching for Corky for 11 years, and now it's got him. Wendy shook her head and said, oh, Polly Wally Doodle all the day. Where'd you get these stories from? You must get up. Everyone in Lizard Street is worried about you. I don't want to see anyone, Ruskin said. Everything that is me hurts. My toenails hurt, my hair hurts, my eyelashes hurt, my teeth hurt. I feel tired all the time and I can't stop crying. There's an ugly taste in my mouth that I can't get rid of. And when I fall asleep, I dream that Corky is alive and the ambulance was a mistake. Have some tea, Wendy said, then you'll feel better. I've got some chocolate biscuits. But the thought of chocolate biscuits reminded Ruskin of Corky. So he started to cry again. 
Corky can't be gone, Ruskin said, weeping. How can he be gone when he didn't even finish his story? Oh my goodness, how sad. I was not expecting that today, children. But we will find out just why Corky gave the helmet to Ruskin later in the book. We've only got this much left. I'm sure it's going to come into play later on. Tune in tomorrow to find out more.